but here I am, and I'm going to say a, a lot of things. <laughs> So hopefully at least a few of them are interesting. Um, we, we will see. Uh, my, my title, Bugs, Bones, and Ancient DNA, uh, Sue Powell, who, who organized this, and she's lovely, and she does a lot of work for this. She stole this. This is my Twitter handle, Bones and Bugs. That, that's, that's where she came up with the title. Um, so please forgive me if I don't fulfill any expectations that are there. Um, I, I appreciate this, this lovely introduction from, from, from George. Um, I'm, as I said, honored to be here. Uh, what I thought I would do was begin by... Um, showing you a, a, a very short clip that I made while I was wearing one of my hats as a National Geographic Explorer. We were making some short videos to show at uh, middle schools and elementary schools about the type of work that we do in the Arctic. And so I, I, what I like to think is that if I start off with this clip, then you understand me a little bit better and you know how to interpret the kinds of things that I'm going to be telling you later. So let's just begin with, uh, with this. The audio is a, a little bit poor, but bear with me here. This is really cool. What we've just found, you can see, is one, two, three, four pieces of mammoth bone here. These are mammoth this is part of a vertebra, so you can see how big this is. And the neat thing about this is that these are the small pieces, which means that the stuff is washed downstream. See, these pieces are actually still frozen in the permafrost. We can't get them out at all, which means they're going to be really well preserved. Just heard that big splash of water back there. That means another hole is broken through. Here comes the water. We better get out of here. <laughs> so that, that last part, uh, that wasn't planned. Um, <laughs> What, what happens there is, so this is uh, up, in, up near Dawson City in the Yukon Territory in Canada where they're doing a lot of placer mining. They're trying to get to the gold-bearing gravels that are beneath all of this Ice Age muck that's there. But that muck is, in some cases, 700,000 years, but in most cases, somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years of accumulated, rotting, decaying plants and animals. So when they're washing it and it becomes thawed and this big thing breaks through and all this water comes washing over top of you, that water is disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> right? You do not want that to get on your body because you will stink. It is really gross. So, so yeah, I had to to get out of there. So, in any case, I, I am I'm an evolutionary biologist. So, you might wonder what an evolutionary biologist is doing, hanging out with gold miners in the Yukon, or 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 doing silly things like this with National Geographic. Um, I actually got into this field because I was. I'm, I have been, since I was a, a little kid, really interested in everything that we share this planet with, all the plants and animals that are around, and have been concerned about what's happening to them. Why are species becoming extinct? Why are species losing the range? And are there things that we can do, reasonable things that we can do, not like dedicate half of the Earth to them as much as I appreciate Ed Wilson and his great ideas. That's a stupid idea. It's not possible, right? Why are there reasonable things that we can do to help protect and preserve the species that are there? And so I became interested in climate change research. And if you're interested in climate change, the topic about climate change, you've probably seen lots of pictures like this, where we can see that there is some massive droughts or other types of devastation that are pushing plants and animals to the, to the brink of extinction. And you follow the popular literature and you see stuff like these headlines, which just tell us basically that everything is going to hell in a handbasket and we may as well give up. But as a biologist, you might want to, instead of just panic like this, you might want to try to figure out how the species and ecosystems that we share the planet with are going to respond to the climate change that's protected and projected to happen in the future. And if you follow the, the more scientific literature, you've probably seen a plot like this. This is a very famous plot. This is Michael Mann's hockey stick graph, because it looks like a hockey stick on its side, which shows the average global temperatures over the last 100,000 years. This is estimated looking at oxygen isotopes in ice. And you see that it's about, about you know, steady for a long while, and then it, it shoots up within the last hundred or so years, about the same time as we see the industrialization of the rest of the world. You project it out this way and it shoots crazily up, up, up and away, right? But this is not the first time in the relatively recent geological history of our planet that we have seen a rapid global warming event. 
Here's a similar plot that ignores the last 100 years that extends instead of 1,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago. And again, this is an estimate of average global temperatures based on oxygen isotopes. And what we see is this incredible fluctuation over time that we've heard about and we think about in terms of the last ice ages. But I want to draw your attention to this part right here. This rapid warming event here that happened around 12,000 years ago, this is the warming out of the peak of the last ice age and into the warm Holocene, the present day that we're having right now. And some of the work that we've been doing in the Yukon, where we can see this event, we can actually see the trees come in and the global warming happen in the dirt that we can get access to, and we can date it. We think that this particular, well, part of this, about eight degrees Celsius warming, probably happened over the course of 20 to 40 years. That is an incredibly rapid period of global warming. And using the technologies that we have started to use and develop in ancient DNA, we can actually go back in time and look directly at how the populations and communities and ecosystems evolved throughout, before, during, and after this past period of rapid climate warming to learn how these communities and ecosystems actually responded to this past event. The goal here, that we can learn something from the past that we can use to make informed decisions about how to use what resources we have to protect and preserve species today. So the field that I work in is called ancient DNA. Um, this just means DNA that is in bad shape. It doesn't necessarily have a particular age associated with it, but we can get really old DNA. I've worked mostly in Beringia. This is the part of the world here. Um, so on this side, we have Alaska. Over here, we have Siberia. You see the, the light coloration here. That is where the ocean is more shallow. So during ice ages, when much of the water on the planet was taken into making giant glaciers that sat on top of the continents, the sea level was lower, and this was land. And this was an important conduit for exchange of plants and animals going from North America into Siberia and vice versa. Horses, for example, move from North America into Siberia. Things like mammoths and people move from Siberia into North America. And we can actually trace this as it happens. Today it looks like this. I'm actually taking this picture from that helicopter right there, which I'll show you in a minute because it's awesome. Um, but in the past, during the Ice Ages, it looked more like this, where there has, was a rich grassland community that supported an equally rich community of herbivores and carnivores. So we fly out into the, the wastelands of wherever. I told you I was going to show you this helicopter. Isn't this great? You see that there's actually not windows in a few of those slots, right? Yeah. <laughs> which is really good because um, when, we, when we loaded our stuff onto this helicopter for the third time, because the first two times it didn't actually take off and we had to unload it again, but the third time we loaded our stuff into this helicopter, we were sitting on top of these, those, that's the gas tank, right? We were sitting on top of that gas tank and the helicopter finally took off and then the, the French and Russian team coordinating the expedition decided to celebrate by smoking while sitting on the gas tanks. But, you know, the, the windows were open, so fresh air, right? Yeah? Uh, so we fly out into Siberia. We stay in, in five-star accommodation. These, these are mosquitoes. Yeah? I just took, I just took a, a 13 UCSC undergraduates on a four-week camping trip in the Arctic as part of a class that I taught for EEB, and they didn't think they were going to see mosquitoes. <laughs> And they were wrong. <laughs> they didn't like it. Um, <laughs> and we wander around wherever the permafrost is melting. This is actually an active placer mining site, one of the gold mining sites from near Dawson City. Here they are. The gold miners are washing away this frozen dirt to get to the, to the bones that are underneath. And as they wash that dirt away, thousands of bones like these, and I'll have these later if you guys want to check them out, come washing out of the permafrost. These are all... Um, Radiocarbon non-finite, which means they're older than 50,000 years. So if, you, if you're interested in checking these out later. I also have a piece of mammoth tusk. You know, foreboding. Um, so we collect them. There's my people standing around here doing nothing, just waiting for fun <laughs> things to happen. We collect them. And we, we, we sort them out. Here we have lots of, there's some bison here and horses and mammoth. And every now and then we get carnivores like giant bears or saber-toothed cats and stuff like that. We take a little chunk out of them and we take them back to our clean lab at Santa Cruz, which is a 
really wonderful state-of-the-art facility where we grind them up and we extract their DNA. And from looking at their DNA sequences and how the amount of diversity in these populations change over time, we've learned quite a lot about how these different populations responded to rapid periods of climate change. Some of the first insights that we had had to do with bison and mammoths and horses. This is a, a bison skull that's from the Arctic where I work. And we hit, there were used to be these giant populations of bison. By extracting DNA from hundreds of these fossils, we can actually reconstruct how big their populations were and how that population size changed over time. And that's what this plot is showing you here. The, the pink plot is bison population size. Up there means big populations. Down here means small populations. And you see they fluctuate over time. But what's most interesting and important about this is that there are two main hypotheses about what caused these megafauna the bison and horses and mammoths of North America to come, become extinct. And they are that people killed them, which is this line right here where people coming in, or that they really couldn't handle the peak of the last ice age, which is also highlighted here. But what you can see from these two plots of bison and horses is that these two species began to decline well before, thousands of years before either of those things actually happened. So there's something else going on in these populations where they're responding to resource availability and water availability. And we wouldn't have been able to see this at all if we hadn't been able to get DNA from these older bones. More recently, we've been using DNA from bison and horses in Alaska because they're different if they're in the north than in the south to really figure out exactly when it was that people managed to move from the north to the south. And this has been a new innovation that's only possible because we can get DNA from these remains. Last year, we were studying all these different horse bones and we discovered that the horses that we thought were just regular horses were actually two different horses and two extremely different horses. One of them was the regular horse that we thought we had and the other one, which also went extinct only 12,000 years ago, was an entirely different genus of horses that's ancestral to all living equids. The ancestor of donkeys and zebras and horses was alive in North America, completely unknown, without DNA until 12,000 years ago. These are the kind of discoveries that we can make using ancient DNA. Another cool thing that we've been working on in, in our group is this idea of admixture between closely related species. And over the last several years, we've been working on several different species pairs, Neanderthals and humans, brown bears and polar bears, wolves and coyotes, and showing that species boundaries may not be as easy to define as we thought they were. Um, we found, for example, that there are at least four different populations of hybrid brown bear, polar bear individuals, where the hybridization took place during the last ice age, the last time brown bear and polar bear populations overlapped. If they can interbreed, they do. And in fact, this really came to light last month when our most recent paper about this was published showing that cave bears which lived in Europe until around 20,000 years ago, also interbred with brown bears. So we like to think of the only this weird thing with all these different species interbreeding is probably just dogs and wolves and coyotes. We know that they can do that. But bears can too. Cave bears, brown bears, polar bears, possibly even black bears. What we're learning is really changing the way that we think about how evolution happens. What does it mean to be a species? And this has implications for how we decide to protect and preserve the species that are around. So I like to think about this in terms of we're learning really interesting things about how evolution works. And we're really providing these new insights, surprises, discoveries that we can only get because we can get DNA out of these old remains. And every time we publish papers, we get a lot of phone calls from people in the media who want to talk to us about stuff. And I'm always excited to talk to them about this stuff. But normally, they really are just edging toward this one particular question that they always want to ask me, which is about when we're going to bring mammoths back to life. And I get this, you know? I mean, obviously, we want to bring extinct species back to life because we've done this before, and, you know, it worked it went well. <laughs> but to be fair, you know, I, I am asked about this a lot. I, I'm not making it up when I say that every time I talk to somebody about the work that we do in ancient DNA, they want to know if we're going to bring a mammoth back to life. And so actually, a few years ago, I wrote a book about this. I wrote a book called How to Clone a Mammoth. You can buy it on Amazon and, 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 wait, you can also buy mammoth hair, right? So put the two together, right? 
<laughs> Everybody's getting the idea? Everybody's looking at me like, yeah, you can't bring a mammoth back to life. You keep saying we can't bring him. I've seen you on the YouTube saying we can't bring mammoths back to life. Fair enough. But I can't be here. I can't be here, right, without giving you the latest and greatest update about where we are as far as bringing mammoths back to life. And so here I am. And you're lucky. You're, you're absolutely lucky because just this morning, seriously, just this morning, it was still not possible to bring mammoths back to life. <laughs> And so we're clear, it is not possible to bring mammoths back to life, or passenger pigeons, or Neanderthals, or Hitler, or dodos, or this weird extinct species of horse that I've just introduced you to, saber-toothed cats, dinosaurs, obviously we can't bring dinosaurs back to life, the thylacine, which is sad, great auk, the gastric brooding frog, but let me tell you, if I were going to choose, look at that thing. It swallows its tadpoles, they develop in its stomach gastric brooding, and then it barfs up fully formed frogs. That is awesome. <laughs> Right? If you were going to bring something back, no, yes, right? <laughs> Gastric brooding frogs, Carolina parakeets, and um, my very first dog, Max, actually. Uh, and, and the reason that I end on Max is you probably have heard that you can pay $100,000 or $200,000 to have your, your dog cloned by some outfit in South Korea, and you can do that. But... That dog, despite being genetically identical to your animal, is still not your animal, just like any other thing. We could take an elephant and we could swap out some of its genes with mammoth genes. We could grow it up in a dish in a lab and then we would put it in an elephant and it would be born to an elephant and raised by elephants. And would it matter that it had some mammoth genes? This dog that's a clone of a dog will not have had any of the same experiences or life histories or food or gut contents or injuries or anything that your dog would have had. So, I'm sorry, but there is absolutely no way that I can foresee that even if we can do technically everything correct, that we're ever going to bring back an identical copy of something that's extinct. I'm sorry. <laughs> but there is a lot that we can do. And with the rest of the time that I have here with your attention, I'm going to try to tell you about some of the awesome things that we are doing in the field of ancient DNA, not thinking just about where we were, being able to extract DNA from bones and learn about how these animals can change, but where we're going next. What, what is the, the, the next frontier in this, in this crazy kind of insane field? And I don't mean bringing mammoths back to life. I really have, I'm done with that uh, for today. Um, you're welcome to ask me about it later. Uh, so. <laughs> So with, with Ed Green, who's back there, um, I run the paleogenomics lab at UC Santa Cruz. And um, actually, some of our folks are over here. I'm happy to see. I'm um, very excited to see. I'm kind of actually more scared to talk in front of my own students than I am to talk in front of crowds, so I'm feeling weird about that. But uh, we do a lot of cool stuff in the lab. We have a big technology development component in the lab where we're trying to figure out better ways to extract DNA from old things. Then once we have that DNA, we use it to address a whole bunch of different questions in evolutionary biology, some theoretical things, some really foundational things, and then some more applied questions, like how can we use information from the past to, to inform management decisions for endangered species today. There are really four premises to what we do in the lab. The first is that we can get DNA out of everything, and I mean everything. We can get DNA out of shells, out of museum skins, out of poop, out of the internal contents of things, out of books that are made of human skin. We have done this. It's weird, but, you know, people do that out of seeds, grapes, hair, bones, teeth, the, the dental calculus you scrape out of teeth. We can even get DNA out of air filters in this room. We could tell you that you've been in this room by getting DNA out of there, and that's really creepy, but we can do it, right? <laughs> Secondly, the DNA that we recover from these things is often in really terrible condition. And that is because as soon as an organism dies, the DNA starts to be broken down by elements in the environment, by UV radiation from the sun, by the action of freezing and thawing that expands and contracts cells, by microbes that get into the skin from your guts maybe, or from the sediment that start breaking down that DNA and catabolizing it. And this means that by the time we get DNA out of a horse bone like this, the fragments are really short and they're really damaged. 
So normally, if I were to extract DNA from like my own skin, I could get really long, millions of bases long fragments. But from a bone like this, and here's just an example, we get in the, in the range of an average of 28 bases long to maybe some things that are slightly better preserved. This means that we have to develop ways of really grabbing a hold of the information that we can get and taking, making the best advantage of whatever we can do. It's also true that the supply of this DNA is finite. These things aren't alive. We can't take cells and grow them up in culture in a dish and just have an infinite supply of it, but we have to make the best use of the little tiny things that we can get. The sequence of the Denisova, the new human species, probably not a species, that was discovered by the group that Ed used to work in in Leipzig, that whole genome came from a tiny little pinky bone, all of it. But once that is gone, once it's been ground up and DNA has been extracted from it, there isn't any more. If you don't get it, if you actually can't capture those molecules, you're washing that information literally down the drain, and you're never going to get it back. And for this reason, it is new technologies new experimental methods to be able to recover DNA, new computational methods to be able to say what that DNA is, that really is going to drive discovery in our field. And that is why our lab is set up the way it is. And so we do have a very strong foundational um, methods development, technology development component. We're very lucky to be in Santa Cruz because this is a fantastic environment for this kind of thing. In fact, there have been two startup companies that have come out of our lab so far based on technology that's been derived from doing ancient DNA. They're both in Santa Cruz. Dovetail Genomics is one, and Claret is a very new startup that's actually quite small. And so this environment that we're in, the, the, the proximity to Silicon Valley, the ability, the, just being on the, Calif the coast of California really does provide the right atmosphere and environment to drive this type of discovery that's driving our science, but also driving, driving innovation and hopefully helping to build up Santa Cruz as a place where people can think of for this type of, of exciting work. So what is next? I'm going to tell you about two different things, that uh, two different areas in ancient DNA that I really feel are the future of our field, um, areas that we're working quite, quite hard on right now. Um, the first is environmental DNA. So relatively recently, it was discovered that we can get DNA from a plug of dirt that tells us what everything is that lived there. Plants and animals and microbes, we don't need very much DNA for this. We can do it in water, we can do it in dirt, we can do it from air. It's very hard to do, but there are technologies that are allowing us to recover the DNA. And combined with ancient DNA, we can start to ask some really fascinating questions. So this is one of those sites that I work at in the Yukon, and the oldest things are on the bottom, and the youngest things are on the top, and you can see the gross, disgusting water melting down from the top. But these layers actually have two very important important things that you can see here. The first at the top, you see that part where the sticks and stones and branches start coming in. That is the layer where the Ice Age ends and the Holocene begins. That is the massive turnover in communities that's associated with that eight degrees Celsius warming. This other layer right here, there's some burning, there's some charcoal. That's the first evidence of human occupation in that region. We can go through here and take plugs of dirt that go up this particular segment, and we can start to understand exactly how biodiversity turned over when humans first arrived and then when that climate changed. We don't need bones. We don't need macrofossils. All we need is a little plug of dirt. This is an amazing and powerful technology that is really in its absolute infancy. One of the most exciting projects we've been involved with so far to this end is trying to figure out exactly when and exactly why mammoths went extinct on St. Paul Island in Alaska. St. Paul is located right there on the map. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's this adorable little town. It has a population of 484. We were in the field there one summer and a baby was born and they changed the sign. They actually had a party around the sign and changed the sign. It has one school, a post office, a bar, a small store, a church. It's a Russian Orthodox church. They're all um, Native American people with Russian names. And that's because people only arrived in St. Paul a couple hundred years ago. Or actually uh, people that were kidnapped from the Aleutian Islands and deposited on St. Paul by Russian explorers to help them kill seals. 
mammoths lived on St. Paul until relatively recently. So here's a plot that shows how big St. Paul was. Um, the yellow shows how big it was over different time points. So it was uh, actually linked to Alaska while the sea level was lower, and therefore it was linked to Alaska, so it had all of the same fauna and flora that would have been there. And then it decreased in size until around 6,500 years ago. Mammoths went extinct somewhere between about what we knew at the time, somewhere between about 4,500 and 6,000 years ago, right after it maintained it's it, right after it achieved its smallest size it is now, and people didn't arrive until um, the, the 18th century. So we went out onto St. Paul. There's one source of fresh water on St. Paul. It's a volcanic caldera called Lake Hill. We went out during the summer, and we drilled a big hole down through the lake, and we collected these long cores. You see these long cores here? And then we went down the length of those cores, and we isolated all sorts of different things. Not just DNA, but we looked for plant macrofossils. There is fungi that only grows on the poops of megafauna, so we collected those to see when megafauna were there. Different types of nitrogen, pollen, little animals that live in either brackish water or other things. And we actually solved this paleontological mystery. This is a big data slide. It's not that important to look at, but what I've tried to show here, these are all the different things that we collected from these cores. What happens is if you start back here 11,000 years ago and you go toward the present day, here we have the results from the DNA. This is this line here. Um, where it's green, we got mammoth DNA out of the soil plugs, and where it's red, we didn't. So we get mammoth DNA out of the soil plugs until around here. These are bones that we collected, mammoth bones that we dated. So this pretty much agrees with the age of the mammoth bones that are there. And this is the fungus that grows on the poops of megafauna. So the fungus is there until the megafauna disappear, and then it's not there until the Russians come back and bring people and caribou, in which case the fungus reappears. But everything else is then telling us about the climate history, what's going on in that place. And what we see is that the lake, the only source of fresh water on that island, is becoming increasingly shallow, it's becoming increasingly salty, and it's becoming increasingly turbid. And we can see this by looking at soil magnetism, the amount of erosion, the isotopes that are telling us about what's going on with the water, and the little animals, the clodocerans and diatoms that live inside that water that become the type that prefer to live in turbid and salty water. Mammoths went extinct on St. Paul because they ran out of fresh water. That's the only reason. They had one source of fresh water, but using this way of looking back through time, just based on plugs of DNA, we were actually able to solve this problem and really figure out why they went extinct. This was an amazing, amazing feat uh, a few years ago, and it actually uh, won the Cozzarelli Prize for the best biology paper in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science because we actually brought together people from different fields to do this in a way that was really convincing. So this was a really fun project to be a, a part of, and I think shows some of the power of, of environmental DNA and this environmental ecology to be able to learn about how systems change through time. But that's not the only thing that we can learn by sampling from these last remaining populations. And the, the actual last population of mammoths lived on an island called Wrangell Island off the northeastern coast of Siberia. And they went extinct around 3,000 years ago. The, the, the mammoths on St. Paul went extinct around 5,600 years ago. So these mammoths lived until really recently. There were mammoths alive 3,000 years ago. And DNA from these mammoths show us exactly what we might predict would happen if you're the last of your species living all by yourself on an island. They become increasingly inbred. They become increasingly isolated. They start to lose genes and develop mutations and stop codons. They were going through a period of spiral decline, the extinction spiral. In fact, this is what we're seeing is happening with most of the larger mammal species that we've studied. And this is a relatively simplistic plot here showing what's going on, but in the past you have these big contiguous plots of land where all the species are together. You're able to find a mate with individuals that are very distant from you geographically, which probably means they're genetically different from you. But then over time, as the habitat changes, the climate changes, these pockets of, of suitable habitat start to become more and more distant from each other. And as this happens, these individuals can't make it in between. And perhaps this is what happened when the megafauna went extinct. Because we have this changing climate where we're getting increasingly patchy habitats across the northern part of, of, uh, of the world. And at the exact same time, we have this brand new predator who's particularly smart and clever 
And that predator knows not only that these patches of habitat are where to go to find these things, but can also limit dispersal between them. And so what we end up seeing is increasingly inbred and increasingly isolated populations of all of these species that we've been studying, mammoths and woolly rhinos, caribou today, even bison and horses. So it's a combination of this climate change associated with this disconnectivity of habitat and then human impact that probably caused these species to go extinct. Of course, this isn't limited to the past. And if we think just about the one large mammal that we have left around here, we know that this is a problem now. With the Santa Cruz Puma Project, they stick uh, these, these collars on mountain lions and they can measure exactly where they are. This is the fate of one juvenile male from the Santa Cruz Mountains trying to disperse and find his own habitat. This is a normal thing for mountain lions to do. They have to get out, they have to go somewhere far away, and they have to find a mate who's not related to them. So what happens to this guy? He starts over here in the Santa Cruz Mountains as a juvenile. He goes over the Santa Cruz Mountains. He visits downtown Mountain View and gets caught in somebody's car. Right? He actually caused an enormous stir by hiding in a parking garage, and he had his own hashtag for a while. It was an absolutely crazy thing. And then he got killed trying to cross the road. This is a sad story, but this is not the only mountain lion that this happens to. And the problem is he can't get out. This is an animal who's absolutely trapped. He's only doing what it's natural for a juvenile male mountain lion to do, trying to find some other range to go. So what do we do? How can we... How can we make life better for these animals? If we know that the problem is a lack of connectivity, we have to restore that connectivity. And there have been some proposals of how to do this. There are these, uh, this is um, one of these uh, crossings that's been proposed for mountain lions that live in the, the, the hills of, of uh, Los Angeles to try to get these mountain lions to cross the road. Maybe that will work if they will actually use that. They, we know that they can't cross the, the road right now, so the mountain lions in Hollywood Hills are completely isolated from everyone else. We can also do translocations. Mountain lions are the same species as Florida panthers. This is perhaps the most famous example of saving a, a population from extinction by translocation. Fish and Wildlife Service in the 90s took 10 female panthers from the Texas puma population and released them into Florida, allowed them to breed with the Florida panthers, and it reversed their crooked tails and crypt orchid inability to make sperm. They actually saved that population. They were able to take these individuals and, and actually put them there. But how do we know what individuals we're supposed to move? How can we actually measure this so that we can, we can make a difference when we're trying to change the way that we do these things? This is also something that we do in our group. Again, looking into the past at what diversity used to be present and how diversity changes over time. Um, we have, with people in our group, collected genomic data from mountain lions from several different populations across North America and in Brazil, which is the origin of mountain lions. They moved out of uh, Brazil into North America around 300,000 years ago. And if we look across their genomes, this is a complicated plot, but if we look across their genomes, this is two individuals from Santa Monica near Los Angeles, two individuals from Santa Cruz Mountains, two individuals from Florida, and two individuals from Brazil. These bars show places in their genome where they have the same DNA from mom and from dad. The only way that this can happen is if they're inbred. So the more bars that there are, the more closely related their parents are, the more inbreeding that there is. It makes sense that the Florida lions, this is prior to the Texas panther admixture event, have lots of inbreeding there. But these other lions also have lots of inbreeding. So can we use this sort of information to say, look, Santa Cruz is missing this diversity here. The whole population has lost that diversity. Let's find an individual from a nearby population who hasn't lost that diversity and translocate them. So this is one of the ways that genomics, I think, has the potential to help conservation. But I started off talking about environmental DNA. So how can environmental DNA actually help us to be able to instantiate genomics as a real tool for conservation? And this is where we have to start. So at the World Economic Forum last year, the project called the Earth Biogenome Project, which is led by Harris Lewin at UC Davis, was announced. It's going to be formally launched at the Wellcome Trust in October this year. And we at Santa Cruz, as well as a team that's been involved with developing a program we call Cal eDNA, are actually going to be launching um, California EBP. We're going to start here in collaboration with NASA JPL, and we're going to use satellites to identify where we should track 
and we're going to start sampling all of the environments across our state to characterize the diversity that's present there. And in knowing where different species are, where they live, and how they're moving, and being able to track them over time, that will be the first step to developing this incredible resource that we need to really put genomics in action for conservation. Before we can start to use genomics to save species, we have to know what we got. And so we're going to try to lead that with California, using California as an initiative and a founding partner of this Earth Biogenome Project. So what else? I said I'm going to tell you about two different things. So for a long time in ancient DNA, we have focused on generating genome sequences, DNA sequences that tell us A, C, G, T, exactly what different species are. But that's not really what we want to know as biologists. Instead, we want to know what those A, Cs, Gs, and Ts actually do. We don't want to know the genome. We want to learn the biology of those species. But this is hard. We have all sorts of fantastic data, and we can get all sorts of wonderful ACs, Gs, and Ts and build these genomes. But we don't have living animals. We can't do experiments. We can't look at phenotypes. We can't tell what color something was, or how big it was, or how it behaved, or what its physiology looked like. But maybe we can. And this, I think, is where the next frontier in ancient DNA is. Not just looking at the genotype, but asking, using modern genome engineering technologies, and also some of these technologies that we have to grow organoids and cells and culture, maybe do experiments and model organisms like mice, can we express some of these ancient phenotypes to really learn what they are? And this, I think, really is the most fascinating potential aspect of ancient DNA. I'm going to tell you one story about a project that we're involved with to this end. So there is a gene called NOVA1, which is a neuron-specific alternative splicing factor. This means that this is a gene that takes all the bits of a gene that has exons and introns and cuts out the introns and sticks those exons together in different ways. It actually determines what proteins are made from those genes, and sometimes when they're made and how much they're made. This neuron-specific alternative splicing factor is known to be associated with neural development and differentiation. Interestingly, after the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes were sequenced, it was discovered that humans, all humans, every human that's ever been sequenced, has a private mutation in this gene that makes it different from Neanderthals, different from Denisovans, and different from everything else. This is a gene that is only in humans, and it's always in humans. And it's in a part of the genome where, for a very long stretch, no human has any Neanderthal DNA. Now, we've learned that Neanderthals hybridized with humans, and we know that we all have somewhere around five, six or so percent Neanderthal DNA in us. If we add everybody up, it's not the same amount, we get about 65 percent Neanderthal DNA. That other 35 percent, humans have gotten rid of for some reason, maybe by chance, or maybe because it's important. And here we have one of those regions where maybe it's because it's important. All humans are the same, all Neanderthals are different, it has to do with brain development. This is a great candidate for trying to explore, is this a signature of what it is to be human? In collaboration with Alison Motri's lab at UCSD, we have grown brain organoids, human brain organoids, that have the human version of this gene and the Neanderthal version of this gene. And we have allowed those organoids to begin to develop and differentiate, and then we measure the proteins that are made by these different alternative splicing factors. And we have found, at a very preliminary, preliminary figure here, that they are very different from each other. The human version and the Neanderthal version express different genes at different times. And the organoids themselves look incredibly different. So here, we're at the very early stages of learning about this gene, but I think this is on to something pretty cool. Here we have little tiny brains that, with the human version, compared to with the Neanderthal version, are behaving very differently in a gene that's fixed in humans as different and associated with developing brains. Now, this, I think, brings me to what I'd like to be my last point, kind of a, a final defense for studying the past. We never would have known that humans had interbred with Neanderthals if we hadn't sequenced the Neanderthal genome and compared it to humans. 
Now that we do know that humans interbred with Neanderthals, we can scan across these genomes and we can really start to narrow in on the specific mutations that have happened in our lineage that make us different. A whole new field has emerged to use this and to do exactly this because we just went into the past and sequenced Neanderthal DNA. Science is driven by discovery. The past, by its very nature, is different than anything that exists today and therefore is ripe for this kind of discovery. With ancient DNA, we can actually reach into the past. We can look at past communities and past populations and past ecosystems. We will discover patterns and processes that don't agree at all with whatever we think is going on today. And that forces us out of our comfort zone to test new ideas and come up with new hypotheses. And this is the purest form of science and exploration. And this is why we do what we do. And I can only hope that we will continue to be able to make new discoveries and to be surprised and inspired and want to keep doing by the things that we have learned. Thank you very much. <laughs>